Greetings uh, from Tehran, from the 32nd International Congress on Pediatrics. To all audiences and participants, welcome to the nephrology panel. Uh, and on the uh, third day of the International Congress, I hope you all have mm, uh, passing, I mean, have passing good days, a uh, good daytime, maybe morning, maybe evening from all around the world. Uh, I wish you have a very, very good time uh, with health and happiness during this difficult uh, COVID pandemic day. Uh, I'm so happy to have the honor of being the uh, manager and the presenter of the nephrology session together with the distinguished awesome lecturers uh, my dear professors i'm sure we are going to have a very very good time together uh, knowledgeful and fun uh, I should remind you that for next day's uh, program you can visit the website visit the application and also the uh, posters of each panel uh, for uh, leading you to each panel's time, day, and also the Zoom meeting IDs and passwords. Uh, for Iranian audiences, I should mention that if you want to get the CME credits, you should register uh, on CME.ir and then uh, in order to qualify for the panel, you should, the pass, you should pass the quiz uh, up to 48 hours after the panel, uh, so you will get the uh, points. Uh, and uh, finally, we are going to be with your professors. I give you an, uh, a little introduction. First of all, Professor Aisha Akjan Arukan uh, from Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, USA, with acute kidney injury and pediatric heart failure. Uh, then Professor Akash Deep from King's College London Hospital from London, UK, with acute kidney injury in children with chronic liver disease. Then we have uh, Professor uh, Kazem Rahimi from University of, University of Oxford, London, UK, with hypertension burden in children. And also uh, Professor uh, Andrea Seke uh, from uh, Semmelweis University, Budapest, Hungary, with identification of postoperative acute kidney injury in pediatric cardiac patients. Uh, okay, I want to uh, I want to take your time more. We are going to be with my dearest professor, uh, Aisha Akjan Arkan. Uh, welcome, dear professor. Uh, just uh, as a uh, special greeting, uh, çok çok hoş geldiniz. Davetimizi kabul ettiğiniz için çok teşekkür ederiz. Teşekkür ederim. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a uh, good morning here in Houston, Texas. Uh, we're hoping for a good day uh, with everything else that's going on in the country today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to share the screen if that's okay. Of course. Uh... You are the co-host now and you can share your screen. We are with you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, today I am invited to talk to you about um, something that actually is quite near and dear to my heart, acute kidney injury in pediatric heart failure and explore um, different uh, aspects of it. Um, here is my disclosures. I don't have anything pertinent to this presentation. The only disclosure I have is that I am on clinical service and even though I've silenced everything, I can't silence the pager. So if it goes off, apologies. So today we're going to review a acute kidney injury, what it means in terms of the patients with heart failure in the pediatric population and delve into worsening renal function and cardiorenal syndrome and how these might be different or related to each other and talk about subtypes. We're going to visit the epidemiology and talk about at-risk patients, uh, but we're going to focus largely on acute decompensated heart failure in medically managed patients. The other uh, patient populations that are vulnerable, mechanically mechanical circuit or support and the cardiac surgery associated we're not going to really focus on and there is a talk coming on later in the session about the cardiac surgery associated AKI. Um, review briefly the pathophysiology especially as it has implications on treatment and treatment resistance which is diuretics and then think through the continuum of worsening renal function to CKD. So who is at risk? There is different flavors of heart heart failure, right? So the congenital heart surgery, uh, surgical patients are at risk, but we're going to focus on acute decompensated heart failure today. And 
and, and start by saying that definition is not really very clear. Most of the time in the literature, it is decided by the investigators who has heart failure and who doesn't. There is a big quality consortium in, the, uh, in North America uh, trying to standardize cardiac ICU management and outcomes. Um, the cardiac ICU version is called PC4, and they defined a de acute decompensated heart failure, which we're going to call heart failure from now on, as documented systolic and or diastolic ventricular dysfunction and at least one of the following, vasoactives and or diuretics, which are ubiquitous in these patients, as you will know, respiratory, respiratory support of any type of positive pressure ventilation, including high flow nasal cannula or mechanical circulatory support. Heart transplant patients are also another very vulnerable patient group for kidney injury, but we're not gonna focus on them too much today. Actually, not much. We're just gonna mention one uh, brief uh, aspect. So let's just start with the basics. What are the available renal function measures for us in the ICU. The easiest, cheapest, most readily available, very much ignored, but really quite valuable functional outcome, um, functional uh, measure for kidney function is urine. Then we have filtration markers, creatinine and cystatin C in certain healthcare settings where it's available, which is also another um, uh, serum protease that gets filtered from the glomerulus. Then we have damage markers, uh, also so-called no novel biomarkers, although they're not by any means new anymore. They've been around for over a decade, um, but we're not really focusing on non-clinical um, and largely experimental use of those, um, those biomarkers to Today. In order for a, in any agent, any protein, any, um, any um, mediator to be used as a functional marker or, or a marker of renal function, it either has to be filtered across the glomerular basement membrane and secreted, or it needs to be constitutively expressed or induced in the tubules, either by the resident cells or by the cells that are infiltrating the tubules with injury, which are usually the, the the immune molecular uh, immune cells with with their molecular phenotypes so the 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 novel biomarkers are going to come from these infiltrating cells the filtration markers are going to come across the gbm and the urine itself is going to be our easiest available biomarker and we're going to focus on that largely today i'm going to put it to you that we don't know how to define acute kidney injury in the pediatric heart failure population when you look at the literature incidence varies from 15 to 50 percent, but it depends on, the de depends on the definition used. But if you look at renal replacement therapy, that, that incidence is in the single digits. And oliguria, is an, is, even though very important, is not rigorously tested as an AKI marker and has a different facet in the heart failure population. And some increases in serum creatinine, like we're going to visit in a minute, might be transient and actually not necessarily associated with kidney injury. Here is the standardized pediatric acute kidney injury definitions. And I am sorry to say that these are not very consistently and, and rigorously always applied to the the vulnerable heart failure population, either in research settings or in, in the clinical arena. So the reverse chronological order, KD, Go, P. Aiken, and P. Rifle, define kidney injury by relative changes in creatinine from baseline relative fold increases or varying durations of oliguria. This oliguria or relative oliguria is something that we're going to come back and visit very frequently throughout the next 20 minutes. If we use different definitions, we might actually be describing different things in different populations. So an elephant become, could become a spear or a wall or a rope. So this is something that I always like in order to put us in the right uh, mind frame going forward, trying to understand this problem. What is the evidence out there? Here is the most recent, almost hot off the press from PC4 Quality Consortium uh, of all of the heart failure, acute decompensated heart failure admissions admitted in 23 centers that contribute to this registry. Um, and um, in all these admissions, they've looked at outcomes in general, 
uh, interestingly, contrary to what used to happen about five years and definitely 10 years ago, congenital heart disease related heart failure is now becoming more important and prevalent as the etiology for heart failure. They, these investigators did not use a standardized AKI definition like we mentioned. They only looked at renal replacement therapy that was available, available to them. 3% of, of encounters had renal replacement therapy mortality was almost five-fold higher in those patients compared to the rest of the cohort. Definitely a, a, a vulnerable, um, high-risk population. Um, but when we use uh, standardized AKI criteria, this is our patient population that we looked at, patients who are hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure anywhere in the hospital, using AKIN and P-Rifle at admission actually yielded different frequencies of AKI. AKIN was um, um, revealed that patients actually had, about one third of the patients had AKI at admission and more than 50% by P rifle. We tried to use this to apply it to the, the concept of cardiorenal syndrome, this organ crosstalk that happens in heart failure. This second slide I'm showing you is that um, it, it's emphasizing that at discharge, some patients had not actually recovered their renal function, still had persistent renal dysfunction, and they actually were more likely to get readmitted. So what is cardiorenal syndrome then? Some, sometimes these concepts are used interchangeably, and in the literature, you will actually find more information around, uh, under cardiorenal syndrome in heart failure than you would find under AKI. It's really renaming of an age-old concept concept. There is two broad types, acute and chronic. The type five is the systemic uh, disease-related version, which is not really our topic today. Um, cardiac failure leading to renal injury could be acute and chronic, and it's named type one or type two. That's what we're focusing on. So acute cardiorenal syndrome type one would be triggered by a cardiac event and through a a, a variety of mechanisms would lead to acute kidney injury from, uh, from um, either hemodynamic changes or oxidative stress or neuroendocrine uh, perturbations that happen. Chronic cardiorenal syndrome, on the other hand, would be a chronic heart failure setting where there is similar but slightly different mechanisms at play, which leads to acute kidney injury that doesn't recover or repetitive events of acute kidney injury, which then heal mal in a maladaptive fashion, leading to apoptosis, fibrosis, and then eventual progression to chronic kidney disease. And the initial um, per, uh, abnormality, the, the heart failure that actually triggers uh, an adaptive response in the body by increased systemic and renal arterial vascular resistance, which is then neuro, through neurohumoral and uh, non-osmotic vasopressin stimulation leads to renal sodium and water retention with restoration of circulatory integrity over time becomes maladaptive and that actually can perpetuate kidney injury. And even though we're um, conceptualizing it in a very simplified fashion, the main topics that we can actually focus on here is neurohumoral activation, which is initially compensation for increased afterload, decreased preload, and decreased cardiac output, which then over time leads to venous congestion and fluid overload. And and may be exacerbated by some of the, the, inner, the side effects of medications used for heart failure leads to kidney injury, which becomes a vicious cycle. The mechanistic um, relationship between these concepts is not as simple as I've schematized, as, as I've shown you in that schema. It's actually much more complicated, making it more complex to approach these patients. So worsening renal function in children, what is this? This was first described from our 
our center by Dr. Price, who's done a lot of work in cardiorenal syndrome in children. And he was the first to propose worsening renal function as evidence for pediatric cardiorenal syndrome in patients with acutely compensated heart failure. The patients who did not have worsening renal function, which he described as an increase in creatinine of 0.3 milligrams during the hospitalization, were virtually free from mortality or bad support, ventricular assist device support, compared to the patients who developed it. And the 0.3 milligrams came from this um, uh, ROC curve, where it actually had the best sensitivity and specificity for predicting bad outcomes. It is the same construct that is used in adult medicine, so it nicely parallels the stage one acute of acute kidney injury and the worsening renal function that's being used in adult patients with heart failure. Now, there is a, an, a very important thing. This might be the most important thing you can take away from this talk today, and the, it's this link between congestion and AKI and the worsening congestion leading to worsening AKI. Here on the left-hand side, I'm showing you percentage of patients who have worsening renal function. And the panels are CVP, cardiac index, systolic blood pressure, and wedge pressure. From left to right, the indices that are indicated in red are increasing. So what you would immediately see is that the only stepwise increase that almost is a dose response is with higher CVP, even with low cardiac index, which we would normally think about when we think about heart failure, worsening renal function is not as frequent as with high CVP. And here is the ROC curve. This cardiac index is actually almost the, the line of unity, whereas the CVP has a better predictor ability in terms of predicting worsening renal function. And here it is very nicely um, uh, illustrated again. This is high cardiac index, high CVP. This is low cardiac index, high CVP, and this is glomerular filtration rate. And you can see that the high CVP group, regardless of the cardiac index, has lower GFR. We actually looked at it in our own patient population. This is a work by Dr. Price and me, uh, Dr. Jack Price. And uh, we looked at uh, a congested patient population, the ones with pal Fontan palliation, and measured their Fontan pressures uh, by a cath. And those patients who had higher Fontan pressures, which of course is higher filling pressures, higher venous pressures, were more likely to actually have lower GFR controlled for their age differences, um, uh, suggesting that worse congestion also plays a role in the pediatric population. This, of course, is very biologically plausible because perfusion pressure is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and CVP. And as CVP is rising or intra-abdominal pressure is rising because patients are congested to have tense ascites, the perfusion pressure of the kidney is going to decrease. Um, this is a, a slide that actually is about cardiac surgery associated AKI related fluid overload, but I like to, to use it in order to, to illustrate that there is immediate peri illness findings that are linked to adverse outcomes from congestion and fluid overload, and there is long term outcomes associated with it. Congestion in general is related to impaired wound hearing, decreased lung compliance, could lead to ventilation and worsens heart failure. And then over time, we talked about CKD, but there is also bigger global impact about functional disability and death in this patient population. So this is our patient population again, patients admitted, pediatric patients admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. We followed 75 of them and 25 um, of these patients, so one third failed medical therapy. So either required a VAD or went on for transplantation. And we defined standard, it's, cardiorenal syndrome using standardized uh, AKI criteria, and fewer patients would fulfill CRS syndrome if AKIN was used as admission due to nuances in, in definition, how baseline is defined, and p rifle was able to pick up more. But here's what I want you to pay attention to. Even the patients who had no CRS by either criteria on admission were actually likely to develop it during their hospitalization, and the peak CRS predicted failure for, of medical therapy. So clearly it's a something that 
needs very um, uh, meticulous attention. And diuretic use is ubiquitous in this population and loop diuretics are commonly the first line agents. They do have some um, adverse uh, uh, inadvertent uh, consequences that actually worsen arterial underfilling and maybe stimulate renin and geotensin aldosterone system, so work against us. But what is, and, and other um, diuretic regimens could be added to loop diuretics in order to troubleshoot this diuretic resistance that could develop. But what is more, more important for us is the ability to actually assess the kidney's response to diuretics. So it's not diuretic resistance, it's diuretic responsiveness. Um, here is an example from cardiac surgery where Lasix and, and urine output response to Lasix furosemide in two hours and six hours, immediately after one dose, actually di could differentiate patients who de would develop AKI in the coming days from patients who would not develop AKI. This also is something we inherently know in clinical practice. We know patients who don't respond to diuretics probably had wor have worse injury, but I don't think we quantify it enough. And that's what I would like to show you today about some of our data that we actually recently did and published, and not think of it as a diuretic resistance, but more like a diuretic response phenomenon. This is in adults conceptualized as weight loss per unit 40 milligram dose of furosemide or equivalent or net fluid loss per milligram of loop, loop diuretic, because that is what we're trying to get to. We're trying to decongest these patients. Uh, and, and trying to reach negative sodium and water balance. And we need to remember the diseased heart operates over a very narrow spectrum of safety. While it's not good to be congested, it's also not good to be over diuresis because that might also be problematic. So we looked at 108 patients less than 21 years of age with heart failure in our system who were receiving loop diuretics for over 72 hours. And we looked at their diuretic response and quantified it or categorized it as high diuretic response versus low diuretic response. The patients who were younger had less obvious congestion on physical exam like pleural effusion or edema and interestingly, higher GFR were more likely to have low diuretic response, and they actually had worse outcomes, longer length of ventilation or more re um, uh, requirement for CRT and a worsening renal function. Um, the, in fact, for each unit decrease in diuretic response, mortality or mechanical circulatory support need increased by 3%. But what astonished us is that at 72 hours, 34% of these patients who were trying to be diuresed for heart failure had had more IV fluids in than out. In fact, if you look at it, regardless of diuretic response, 37% in one group, 54% in the other group had IV fluids. This fluid exposure is a, 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 a frequently ignored part of care in clinical practice. In I'm showing you a, a series of cardiac uh, surgery associated AKI um, uh, papers, not to look at the data itself, but just to look at actual urine output being not very oliguric per the standard definition and the fluid exposure not really being recorded or kept track of. In fact, in one patient population where prophylactic peritoneal dialysis catheters were being placed post cardiac surgery to improve volume replacement or volume management, the patients with PD catheters did better in terms of reaching negative fluid at 48 hours. But if you look at it, the patients who didn't have the PD PD catheters actually ended up getting more fluid. This is not always modifiable, right? Because the patients who are very sick have to have an obligate intake. Sometimes they're getting resuscitated. Sometimes they're on multiple meds like you see here with multiple pumps. So how much of this is a surrogate indicator of the underlying severity of illness is difficult to tease out, especially with retrospective data. And the, the concept of diuretic resistance versus cardiorenal syndrome is sometimes Sometimes difficult to, to differentiate when you only look at the laboratory data because they can actually look quite similar with high BUN, BUN and high creatinine.
this is another um, very intriguing, incredibly elegant study that I'd like to draw your attention to. And this is from adults, but I think it actually has implications for us. So here is decline in EGFR. Here is decline in uh, dilution markers, meaning improvement in the improvement in decongestion. So BMP decre decreasing, uh, uh, hematocrit increasing. They have differential uh, impact on GFR. Decline in EGFR actually is associated with increased risk for um, death, whereas better decongestion is associated with decreased risk for death. But when these things are combined, they actually have opposite effects depending on what is being achieved. So the patients with a decrease in their BMP and increase in their hematocrit, meaning they're congesting from not responding to responding, actually lose the signal as they're getting more decongested. What does this mean? the creatinine that increases when patients are decongested is not necessarily associated with bad outcomes. So even though there is a GFR increase that seems to happen from the creatinine levels going up, that does not, that loses its signal for adverse outcomes. So successful decongestion with the creatinine increase that accompanies it might not necessarily be the same thing as cardiorenal syndrome and failure of medical therapy. Um, another concept that, that we will briefly visit is this improvement in decongestion, improving renal function. This is a, a group of patients from the PDMAX registry who had VAD implanted, and I'm gonna blow that up here, right here for you, for you to show you that upon implementation, which also improves decongestion uh, and, and improves filling, um, the, the GFR um, increase increases quite precipitously across the patient population. Now, it doesn't always stay that way. These patients are at risk for developing CKD later on, as shown by multiple investigators. We looked at our own patients who are on continuous flows and showed that multiple AKI events was the most uh, significant predictor predictor for failing to recover GFR after VAD implantation. So the um, in, 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 as, as I'm wrapping up, I'm going to say cardiorenal syndrome cannot be managed away from the bedside. So if you're trying to differentiate whether a patient is becoming diuretic resistant or has inadequate diuretic response, there is many things that go into the play of that patient that needs to be evaluated as a whole and physical exam needs to be in the middle of it so that we can actually direct the patient's care appropriately because this the differential diagnosis of diuretic resistance or failure of diuretic response could be anything from inability to take meds or refusal to to actually using inappropriate medications that interfere with our diuretics to nephron adaptation to giving too much fluid to true kidney injury or other changes that are happening with worsening heart failure that eventually will lead more support with mechanical circulatory support or, or, or a heart transplantation if that's the path that the patient needs. So take home points. Acute kidney injury, worsening renal function, cardiorenal syndrome are defined slightly differently, but they're all common in pediatric heart failure. If we can use standard definitions, we'll facilitate recognition and talk about the same thing and be able to compare patients across populations. We actually can quantify quantify response to decongestion quite quickly uh, and and successful decongestion is key. So we need to be beware of, of working against ourselves with fluid exposure. Cardiorenal syndrome frequently worsens, worsens in the sickest. This is very nicely demonstrated. Failure to respond might mean more support is needed. And long-term follow-up of this, uh, the vulnerable patient population is essential and, and, and definitely um, uh, would contribute to improving outcomes. With that, I thank you for your attention and I'm going to turn it over to the moderator. My dear Professor I say thanks a million for your nice and awesome presentation. Uh, thanks God that I have 
a multiple chance of having your presentation and be uh, more knowledgeful about the nephrology and AKI section in heart failure. Uh, and also it is a big chance to see your uh, beautiful face even online uh, here from the camera. Uh, dear Professor uh, Akjan, uh, maybe uh, you uh, saw in the chat section, there are two questions. If you are uh, ready and if you let me, I want to ask them over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. First of all, uh, do we need to restrict the fluid of every patient with acute heart failure? I think that's a very good question. It will depend on the physical exam and the the patients who uh, patients physical exam findings for you. What I'm referring to is this knee jerk response of putting everybody on so called maintenance IV fluids. So very frequently we'll find our residents, our fellows, even our attendings don't necessarily think about what we're trying to achieve. Every therapy should be goal directed, right? We don't only think about goal directed therapy in just resuscitation of mm -hmm. sepsis. We have to think about goal-directed therapy in every situation. So if the point is to try to decrease congestion, I think mm -hmm. giving extra IV fluids to the patient doesn't really make much sense. However, there is situations that obviously will be different. For example, a known heart failure patient might come with exacerbation of uh, maybe CKD due to an intercurrent illness because these are pediatric patients. They have, you know, childhood illnesses. So it would would be a case by case basis, but I would say it has to be a very thoughtful and deliberate action and decision. It should not be a knee jerk response. Oh, many thanks for your complete definition. And uh, next one how do we manage the electrolyte imbalances in patients with heart failure? I think that's like a whole session in itself. So. Yes, if, if we need another panel for this. <laughs> I, I think it needs four different speakers because every yes. place has a different approach. So typically, you know, in nephrology, what we teach is that water follows where sodium goes, right? So typically we would try to not give patients a lot of sodium supplementation, but there is, um, the, the, you know, most of these patients who are on loop diuretics would require potassium supplementation. It's a great idea to actually anticipate that and start it even before patients develop hypokalemia. The hyponatremia mm. issue is a little bit challenging because it, there is some adult literature that suggests that if you actually give them high concentration of sodium chloride, you can improve the tubular response to diuretics. Um, we do tend to supplement our patients if they develop hyponatremia. Um, what I will say is my pet peeve is um, not to diagnose and interpret every metabolic alkalosis as contraction alkalosis. Many of these patients have chloride depletion from their mm -hmm. diuretic use. So it is very important to deplete their chloride, especially if they don't actually have good response to diuretics. In fact, low chloride is probably a bigger mediator in diuretic resistance and low diuretic response than we've previously identified and understood and needs to be studied both in adults and pediatrics. So nice. Uh, dear Professor, as I told you in preliminary session, your uh, lecture is awesome and exciting and interesting. So uh, questions are coming and coming. Uh, the next one, uh, uh, one of our uh, doctors asked that, you said renal perfusion is related to MAP minus CVP or preload. Is it correct or not? So renal perfu in perfusion of any organ is going to uh -huh. be mean arterial pressure, which is the driving pressure, and the the uh, the resistance to drainage from the venous um, uh, end, which is going to be your central venous pressure. Uh, Preload is a bit of a different concept, correct? So it really depends on, now let me wear my intensivist hat. It really depends on whether your patient is on positive pressure ventilation, whether your patient is on room air. Yes, preload does play a role in terms of determining your mean arterial pressure in the end because it will play into your cardiac output, but it doesn't really have any role in this definition of mean arterial pressure minus CVP per se. Um, but the the IAP there, which um, I had abbreviated, was for intra-abdominal pressure because uh, there is some patients who are congested, like cirrhotics, 
which you're going to hear about yes. I think, a little bit, um, who might have increased intra-abdominal pressure, who actually will have a higher intra-abdominal pressure than CVP. So the perfusion pressure there is going to be the difference between MAP and intra-abdominal pressure and not the CVP. So nice. I think it is the advantage of having a lecture uh, with multitasking, with multi-professionality, with awesome lecturing techniques. Thanks a lot. And the last one. Uh, someone mentioned that rising creatinine in these patients is not equal to worsening patient situation. Yes or not? I said that, didn't I? And it's shockingly yes. true in adults. So in adults, oh. if you actually want to decongest someone, meaning you they have a lot of fluid overload and response goal-directed diuretic therapy is used and patients get hemoconcentrated, their BMP decreases, their fluid balance improves, but their creatinine also improves, those patients don't have as high mortality as the patients who get the same therapy and have their creatinine elevate, which means their GFR is lower, mm. but fail to decongest. So we probably are not smart enough or don't have the tools to be able to tease out who is going to respond in what way first. And this concept of worsening renal function not being an indicator of kidney damage, but being related to hemoconcentration and, and successful decongestion has not been proven in pediatrics. This is an adult concept, but there is a lot that we take and extrapolate from adult literature into pediatrics. It's not, um, it, it, I think it deserves study in our pa patient population mm. to be able to understand what truly is just changing of total body water and the creatinine increase due to that and what is related to true tubular injury and worsening renal function, which will have an adverse outcome. So it's better to keep an anthrograde concept to uh, research about on this position, in, on this, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, point and uh, topic. And the uh, next one, what else do we have to judge about patients' volume status in these patients chemically? Um. <laughs> what else do we have to judge chemically about patients? Well, uh, uh, you know, I said you are our, one of our best lecturers, so we uh, have to uh, put you in many panels. So. <laughs> people, uh, people use a lot of things. Right? In 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 uh, in clinical practice, we look at the BUN creatinine ratio. We look to see if the hematocrit is changing. It's a little bit difficult if you're drawing a lot of labs on a very little patient and you're inducing iatrogenic anemia to just look at hematocrit because it is probably different in, in adult patients. Um, some people look at BMP. I'm not a big fan. Uh, I like weights. I weigh patients twice a day. I think nice. that's a very easy uh, thing to do. It's a very, um, it should be done in the same consistent fashion on mm -hmm. the same Scale, but I'm a nephrologist. I love weights. Weight for me is a vital sign. So I can't really see a patient without a weight. So I'd recommend maybe just tracking weights as opposed to uh, getting um, more labs. <laughs> And also, it is so applicable. Uh, I think good for your patients. Good for your patients. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Many uh, thanks. What time would the Q and A be? If you could roughly give me a, an idea, because I have to go. Uh, dear professor, of course, we have uh, I mean three lectures in front uh, that we are going to uh, have the video lectures for them. Uh, but uh, I think we finished with your question, Q and A. Uh, if you. Uh, present a three or four panel for us. So. <laughs> okay, wonderful. If you'll excuse me from the Q&A, I'd be very delighted. <laughs> Not oh. that I don't want to spend more time with you, but I'm getting so many texts. That's the reason my eye get, keeps going to my nurses. Oh, <laughs> we are so sorry for that, but oh, uh, we are so sorry for taking your no. time. We are so honorful and so thankful for having you. It was a big, big uh, chance and big honor for us, and we hope and wish to have you again uh, in panels, in webinars, and also in person in Iran. That's wonderful. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. It's Thanks been a, 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 a big pleasure to participate in your uh, wonderful organization. Um, best of luck for the, the rest of it. I'm following it, and it seems to be a great success. So congratulations. Thanks a lot. Have a good day, dear professor. Take care.
Okay, thanks a lot, dear audiences and dear participants. Uh, we are going to be with the lecture of Professor Akash Deep uh, from King's College Hospital, uh, London, UK, with uh, AKI in children with chronic liver disease. Uh, we are going to have video lecture, then we are going to be with you with uh, questions. Uh, if you have any question, uh, you can use the chat section below uh, and we are going to share it with the lecturer. Thank you for this kind of introduction. Uh, my name is Akash Deep. I am the Director of Pediatric Intensive Care at King's College Hospital in London. I chair the Critical Care Nephrology section of the European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. And I'm also the co-chair for the Science and Education Committee of the Pediatric Intensive Care Society of the UK. An absolute privilege and honor to be speaking at this uh, forum. And what I have been asked to do is to talk on acute kidney injury in children with chronic uh, liver disease. Now, what I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes is to take you through the various manifestations of kidney disease which can take place in children with chronic liver disease. And specifically, I'll be talking about uh, hepatorenal syndrome. But what I'll do is start off with what happened in the AWARE study in the liver database, concept of inflammation of acute and chronic liver failure. And as I said, take you through the journey of hepatorenal syndrome and, and end with the recent advances oh, yeah. in the kidney injury in liver disease. Now, if you look at this uh, cartoon, you can see that there are three different kinds of explants. You've got on the top a liver, which is architecturally normal, which has got an enzymatic defect. Okay, you've got, on the other hand, a liver here, which is completely lost its architecture. It's a collapsed liver. This is a liver of a chronic liver disease. It's cirrhotic, and there's no option but to transplant this liver. And here, you've got a liver which has got regenerating nodules, which are these green ones, and collapsed architecture here. And it is this balance between these collapsed architecture, the necrotic architecture, and the regenerating nodules, which will decide whether this liver is going to regenerate on its own or will end up having a transplantation. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is because each of these three livers have a potential to get acute kidney injury. These three livers plus post-transplantation are the four or five different scenarios in which a patient with liver disease can get acute kidney injury. So it was the very famous study, the AWARE study, which was published by us in 2017. We looked at the epidemiology of acute kidney injury in critically ill children. And when we had a deep dive into patients with liver disease, you can see here that we had patients with a GI or liver disease about 1100. Patients who were likely to have liver disease, though more information was required, were about 300, but highly probable were, were about 90. So we did two kinds of analysis. We looked at the 91 children who most probably had liver disease, and we also included those 91 with the likely probability of 284 children. So we analyzed about 375 children who had liver disease in the AWARE data set. And if you look here, I mean, whether it is stage one or stage two, this light blue bar is the liver database and the dark blue is the other patients with, uh, with diseases other than the liver disorder. You can see that stage one, stage two, stage three, or any stage AKI is much more in patients with liver disease. So basically about 60% of patients with liver disease can have AKI at any given point in time. And if you look at the rest of the AWARE cohort, about 26%. So patients with liver disease are, are at threefold more risk of getting acute kidney injury. And if you look at mortality, you will see that it's 5.5% in patients with liver disease versus 3.4% in patients who did not have liver disease. This is unpublished data, but this is a data from the AWARE data set. Now, before we go into the nitty gritties of the kidney disorders in liver patients, a very important concept of acute 
of acute and chronic liver failure syndrome versus acute decompensation. So here is a patient whose liver disease is gradually progressing. The patient is going downhill. And as the liver disease is progressing, the liver numbers go off, ascites, portal hypertension, bleeding, viruses become more severe. And what happens is as a part of the decompensation of the disease, kidneys get involved as well. So kidney involvement parallels the deterioration of liver disease. This is your decompensated liver disease. On the other hand, you have a patient who's ascetic, who's got portal hypertension, sitting stably in the ward, but something happens here. It's an acute insult, bleeding, you have a loss of volume, massive parasynthesis, and you've got a rapid downhill of your liver function. And this patient rapidly becomes a patient with multi-system organ failure, and this is acute on chronic liver failure syndrome. So these two syndromes are distinct, acute decompensation, where the patient's liver disease has decompensated, whereas acute and chronic liver failure syndrome is with an acute insult has converted a stable patient into a multi-system organ failure. Now, though the mortality here is high in ACLF, but there's a chance that this patient can actually go back to where we started, whereas the other cohort, the liver failure, will take the kidney disease down as well. And therefore, there is no chance that this liver disease will recover and the patient will end up getting a transplantation. Now, this is something which is very novel and which, which people are talking about all the time is the concept of systemic inflammation. So it all starts with the bacterial products across the portal hypertension bowel into the, in, in, into the gut, you get lots and lots of cytokines. There is a complete imbalance between your pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And what you get is inflammation. You get inflammatory mediators affecting different organs. And if you look at it, what gets affected the most is the kidney. So kidney affection as a part of the ACLF is a part of inflammation. So if you have a acute decompensation, you will get a chronic systemic inflammation state because of translocation. And when you get ACLF, there's a further acute increase in systemic inflammation because of any insult, be it bleeding, be it infection, be it anything else, and the patient ends up into a multi-system failure. And that is what this syndrome is all about. If you look at it, ACLF1 is only renal involvement. ACLF2 is renal plus one extra renal. ACLF3 is renal plus two extra renal organ involvement. So more severe the organ failure, more higher the grade of ACLF. And if you look at this, kidney is in the center of classification of this liver disorder. So more severe the kidney disease, higher the failure of the liver and higher is it on the MELD scoring. And this is how the online system looks like. You can see that whether it's serum creatinine, renal replacement therapy, or the use of vasopressors here with hepatorenal syndrome, this dictates the severity of liver disease. This dictates how severe the patient is going to be and how urgently the patient should be placed for liver transplantation. And then we in pediatrics converted that into a P cliff so far score, cliff is your chronic liver failure consortia. And if you look at it, everything is converted into pediatric based on centiles. And whether it is to do with your respiratory status, to do with serum creatinine, you can see it's about the upper limit of normal, whether it's less than two, more than three. And based on this, we classify the patients into different categories of acute and chronic. And this is a paper we have just published. It's got published last week, actually. And you can see that higher the grade of rifle criteria with ACLF, more is the mortality. So kidneys are central part to classification of ACLF. But the question is, we always used to say, you know, whenever kidneys get involved in patients with liver disease, it's going to be hepatorenal. And the question comes, is every acute kidney injury in liver disease hepatorenal syndrome? The answer is actually a big no, because if you look at the recent classification, you will find that patients who have, who have got uh, acute and chronic or acute decompensation, they can have non-HRS AKI where you have got hypovolemia due to gastrointestinal bleeding, you can have GI fluid losses, you can have excessive use of diuretics, or it can be nephrotoxic drugs, 
You can have bile acid nephropathy, but very importantly, don't forget your intra-abdominal hypertension because the ascites gets tense, it presses on the renal vessels, the patient doesn't pass urine, and we classify them as acute kidney injury. So this is non-hepatorenal syndrome acute kidney injury, whereas then the other kind of injury is the HRS AKI, which is your hepatorenal syndrome acute kidney injury. If you look at the epidemiology, 50% of patients with cirrhosis and ascites will develop AKI. Hepatorenal syndrome will constitute, if you look at different papers, a very, very small part of this population. Only 7.6% of all 129 cirrhotics with AKI had HRS as the cause of deterioration. And if you look at another multicentral trial, out of the 423 patients with cirrhosis and AKI, about one third patients had ATN, one third had, had pre-renal failure, whereas about 20% had HRS1 and 7% had HRS2. So though hepatorenal syndrome is very important because the treatment is specific, its contribution to the deterioration in kidney function is actually quite limited. And the commonest precipitant of unprecipitated AKI is degree of ascites. Now, is there a difference between adults and pediatrics? Now, if you look at adults, there are numbers are more, the etiologies are different, and they have a longer waiting time, which means that the patient keeps on deteriorating, waiting for a transplant and kidney gets in, involved more often, and hepatorenal syndrome gets more often. But in children, biliary atresia is the most common cause. You get the Kasai, Kasai doesn't work. We, we actually observe them. If there's no resolution of bilirubin within three months of doing a Kasai, we say that the probability of this patient getting a liver transplantation or dying within two years is of the order of 90%. So we list them and we keep a very close eye on them and we give them a transplantation very early. Therefore, these children do not deteriorate as, as much as the adults do and the incidence of hepatorenal syndrome is even lower than in adults. Now let's just go back to acute kidney injury in general critically ill patients and it's based on two things. One is your serum creatinine, whether it is your absolute value or a percentage increase from the baseline and urine output. But both these parameters, whether it's a creatinine or the urine output, have got a problem in liver cirrhosis. Serum creatinine will depend upon your liver synthetic function and it will depend upon your muscle mass. Now, liver synthetic function is gone, therefore the production of creatinine is low and because of the decreased muscle mass, your baseline serum creatinine is low. You start at a lower level and to reach the definition of AKI, your GFR really, really falls before you pick up serum creatinine uh, being high and diagnosing AKI. Therefore, serum creatinine seems to be a very late marker of rise in patients with AKI in patients with chronic liver disease. And therefore, you... Uh, the, this association called International Club of Ascites uh, proposed this, that we should take out the urine output because the urine output could be falsely raised in these patients because of use of diuretics, or they could have an avid retention of sodium despite the GFR being normal, therefore the urine output is out. And they said, let's talk about baseline serum creatinine within the last three months if the baseline serum creatinine is not available in the last seven days and there is a percentage rise. You can see here an increase in serum creatinine more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours or a percentage increase more than 50% from baseline, which is presumed or assumed to have taken place in the last seven days. They have stated it, stage one, two, and three. There are, there are uh, uh, criteria for progression and regression. And then we also talk about when do we call it no, no response? When do we call it partial response? And when do we call it full response? So this is from the International Club of Ascites. So what exactly is a hepatorenal syndrome? Where does it fit in the spectrum of acute kidney injury? We have said it's rare. We have said that there's non-HRS AKI, which contributes a lot, where it's hypovolemia, acute tubular necrosis, acute tubular injury. But what exactly is hepatorenal syndrome? It's a renal failure in a patient with advanced liver disease in the absence of identifiable cause of renal failure. It means it's a diagnosis of exclusion and all investigations should be done to rule out other causes, which I mentioned as non-HRS AKI before we label the AKI as hepatorenal syndrome. 
Now, this is the International Club of Ascites, which first met in 1996, and they proposed criteria for hepatorenal syndrome. Then as our understanding became better, they met again in 2007. But the bottom line was they said, you need to have cirrhosis with ascites. You need to have serum creatinine more than 1.5 milligram per deciliter. And you, you need to show that after you have withdrawn diuretics and given albumin for two consecutive days, there has been no improvement in serum creatinine, no shock, no use of nephrotoxic agents, etc. But if you look at the, the thing which are circled with red, this criteria requires your serum creatinine to reach 1.5 before you diagnose hepatorenal syndrome. 1.5, as I said, you start off with a very low baseline serum creatinine. It means you really, really have to wait to reach 1.5 before you can diagnose hepatorenal and before you can start your treatment. And it's very well known in literature that later you start the treatment, less efficacious it's going to be. If you allow the serum creatinine to rise, and then start treatment, the less efficacious it is going to be. Therefore, the, again, these criteria were revised in 2013, and they say we have to diagnose HRS as a form of AKI. So we are not talking about 1.5 anymore. We are talking about diagnosis of AKI according to the criteria I just mentioned, more than 0.3 or more than 50%, and remaining criteria remain the same, i.e. cirrhosis and ascites, no shock, no... Uh, response after two consecutive days of diuretic withdrawal. But the main thing is we are not waiting here for the patient's creatinine to go beyond 1.5. And the previous criteria of type 1 HRS and type 2 HRS, where type 1 HRS was acute deterioration and creatinine going beyond 2.5, whereas type 2 used to be a gradual rise in serum creatinine to a level between 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter that is no longer used as well. So we are talking about here an acute rise in serum creatinine and satisfying the other criteria and not going with any level of serum creatinine. So these are the basic differences with HRS, AKI, and non-HRS, AKI. As I said, it's to do with systemic hemodynamics. It is to do with extra renal organ failures and very, very importantly, systemic inflammatory response. You get more inflammation, as I'm going to talk later, in acute tubular necrosis in a non-HRS, AKI than in HRS, AKI. This is the data unpublished from King's, where we looked at all our patients with biliary atresia who were listed for transplantation, which means that all of them had a deterioration of liver function to an extent that they required liver transplantation. 76% had gradual deterioration, they were our controls, and 54% of them had acute deterioration, went to multi-system failure, and we call them as acute and chronic liver failure syndrome. And you can see that, that in the patient with ACLF, both the mortality pre-transplantation and post-transplantation is high because they already had kidney dysfunction pre-transplantation. And if you look at the multivariate analysis, you can see here that the presence of hepatorenal syndrome and the use of renal replacement therapy were independent risk factors for mortality in a patient with ACLF in children. So renal decompensation has a poor prognosis in children with biliary atresia and acute and chronic liver failure syndrome. And then this came this study. This was a study from All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, where, where they looked at their large cohort of acute and chronic liver failure syndrome. They had chronic liver failure patients, about 600, excluded all the compensated and decompensated liver disease and took only ACLF, which included Wilson's disease, autoimmune hepatitis. And they found that of the 84 patients, 22.6% of them had AKI, about 47% at admission, and the remaining developed during the course of the hospital stay. They had used the KDGO definition for AKI, and their poor outcome was defined as death or need for transplantation within three months of occurrence of AKI. And the median duration from when ACLF occurred to the development of acute kidney injury was about four weeks. One third of the patients had hepatorenal, one third had sepsis, 20% had nephrotoxic drugs, and the remaining had other causes in the form of dehydration and bile pigment related to acute tubular necrosis. And if you look at the univariate analysis, high bilirubin, high INR, high PELD scores, high systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and the occurrence of 
bacterial peritonitis were associated with the occurrence of AKI. But when these were entered into a multivariate analysis, they found that there were two factors, high bilirubin more than 17 milligrams per deciliter and the occurrence of a systemic inflammatory response, which independently predicted the occurrence of AKI. And you can see here, when there's no AKI, the survival is better. When there is AKI, the survival is poor and the hazard ratio for death is 7.7. So a patient who's got ACLF, if you control for all covariates, it has got a hazard ratio about seven times more for patients to die as compared with patients with no AKI. And these patients with AKI, as you can see, about 50% of them had died and only 26.3% survived with the native liver. So AKI in the presence of ACLF is bad. And how does hepatorenal syndrome take place? It takes us back to a chronic liver disease patient with portal hypertension, where you have got lots of inflammation going on in the gut. There is translocation of bacteria and bacterial products there, production of endotoxins, and these endotoxemia produces pro-inflammatory cytokines, which then causes vasodilatory substances, especially your tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6. And this causes dilatation in the splanchnic arterial bed. Once it gets dilated, you get a decrease in your systemic vascular resistance, decreased effective blood volume, and your renin angiotensin system gets activated. Your sympathetic nervous system gets activated. And basically what you get is renal vasoconstriction and the occurrence of hepatorenal syndrome when you use nephrotoxic drugs, when there is sepsis, when there's excessive use of diuretics. And here is where hepatorenal syndrome takes place. So in summary, it's about splanchnic vasodilatation, which triggers your renal angiotensin aldosterone system, which triggers your sympathetic nervous system. There is a, there is a release of vasopressin and it all causes renal, vas renal vasoconstriction and hence the occurrence of hepatorenal syndrome. Now the question is, acute kidney injury is AKI. Why are we worried about what kind of AKI it is? If you look at this cohort, you can see that if you have hepatorenal syndrome, your survival is really poor, 15%, as compared to when it's infection or hypovolemia or parenchymal nephropathy. And you will see that the odds ratio of dying when you've got hepatorenal syndrome is about seven times more. So you need to know, you know, need to be able to differentiate that the acute kidney injury which you are dealing with is hepatorenal syndrome or non-HRS AKI because it has got both prognostic and therapeutic uh, considerations. You've got various biochemical clinical criteria, but it's very, very difficult. I can, I can assure you that a patient who is having ATN or hepatorenal syndrome, I would say it will require really a sit-down process with the MDT team to say, what are we dealing with at this moment? Is it, is it HRS or is it acute tubular necrosis? And as I said, various things were done, fractional excretion of sodiums, rule of cystatin C, but what has recently come up is a rule of urinary biomarkers, whether it's NGAL, whether it's kidney injury molecule 1, interleukin 6, or, or the liver fatty acid binding protein. And in this study, you can see that if you have got acute tubular necrosis, you have got higher levels of NGAL. And if you've got even different kinds of hepatorenal syndrome, you can see it differentiates very easily from the acute tubular necrosis because it's ischemia and ischemia leads to more shedding of NGAL in the urine. Therefore, you can differentiate acute tubular necrosis from hepatorenal syndrome by the use of biomarkers. Now, we looked at this uh, paper with, where there were about 65 cirrhotic patients. Renal biopsy was done and they had unexplained renal dysfunction where the serum creatinine was more than 1.5. There was no hematuria, no proteinuria, and the ultrasound was normal. But they still found that though it was functional renal failure, 28% of them had structural changes on their renal biopsy, including tubular interstitial injury, glomerular injury, and vascular injury. So the conclusion of this study was that the patients who may appear 
to have functional renal impairment may have underlying parenchymal lesions. And this is, is the toll-like receptors, which is a marker of inflammation and renal dysfunction. You can see that when it is acute tubular necrosis, more toll-like receptor 4 expressions and more calprotectin, which is another marker of inflammation as compared to when it is HRS. So therefore, there is more inflammation in the tubules when there is ischemic, when there's acute tubular necrosis as compared to hepatorenal syndrome. And this potentially could be a, a, a new biomarker and a potential for new therapy. Now, we as intensivists get involved, I think, quite late. What we do is we wait for the, the GFR to decrease, we wait for the kidney failure to take place, and then we take action. Whereas we are taught about early goal-directed therapy, we need to start treatment early, we need to modify the nephrotoxic drugs, we need to make sure that we mitigate the inflammatory injury, we need to make sure that the patient is well filled and the volume status is well calculated, and we need to act early. We should not be acting when the damage has started to take place. So therefore, if you look at the paper which I discussed earlier where bilirubin was high and there was systemic inflammatory response, this group, as soon as they would get a patient with ACLF, with these high-risk factors, they would start the early targeted interventions in the form of stopping or modifying the nephrotoxic drugs, stopping diuretics, early use of kidney-friendly antibiotics for sepsis. They would start replacing the volume if there's a volume loss. And if they felt that the patient was having HRS, they would start early initiation of terlipressin and albumin, which I'm going to come later, and early initiation of renal replacement therapy. So it was, it is very important to keep a very close eye that this patient is at a high risk of developing acute kidney injury. So let's prevent it. And if we cannot prevent it, and if we have to treat it, initiate treatment early. So how do we treat it? We need to do the basics correctly first. Make sure the precipitating factors are treated, whether it's GI bleeding or hypovolemia, whether it's infection, whether it's a large volume ascites. So make sure these factors are addressed first. And once these factors are addressed, then you talk about medical treatment. And if it is hepatorenal syndrome, as I said, the main problem is planktonic vasodilatation. So you need to use a vasoconstrictor <clears throat> which specifically acts on the planktonic vasculature. And that is something like vasopressin or terlipressin or ornipressin. And if you combine it with albumin, what happens is it then increases your circulating blood volume. And then by increasing the circulating blood volume, everything else dampens down. You get a decrease in renal uh, vasoconstriction and the reversal of hepatorenal syndrome. So vasoconstrictors. So various vasoconstrictors, whether it is, as I said, only pressing or terlipressin, you can use octreotide, and there's a role of albumin as an antioxidant and as a volume expander. Now, what does terlipressin do? It's a V1 receptor analog. It's a long-acting synthetic vasopressin analog whose half-life is about six hours, and it can be released over a sustained period of time and therefore can be given as a bolus or as an infusion. And this is where I said it acts on the V1 receptor and causes planktonic vasoconstriction. And we, but we need to be careful because it causes vasoconstriction, it can cause vasoconstriction in other beds as well. You can get uh, your blueness of your toes and fingers, you get you can get coronary ischemias or GI ischemias and, and, and lead to intolerance of feeds. So you need to keep a very close eye on the side effects of terlipressin. And this was an unfortunate patient at King's, which we have ACLF, which we were listing for transplantation, had, uh, had got medically resistant um, HRS was on renal replacement therapy, but he developed intramural air, as you can see, the lactate was climbing up. So this patient had to be delisted because this patient developed side effects because of terlipressin. In pediatrics, literature is really, really poor. Whatever I could find, these two studies, they have used either as a bolus of 20 microgram per kilo or an infusion of 10 to 20 microgram per kilo per hour. And the management dilemmas continue. And the first question is, with albumin or without albumin? Which vasoconstrictor, because the evidence is equivocal, should I use a bolus, should I use an infusion? And if the patient responds, what is the definition of response? And if the patient does not respond, when am I going to stop the vasoconstrictor? And if I treat inflammation or the cytokine storm, will it help? So this is the, one of the two 
studies by Arun Sanyal's group from Virginia and Richmond, where they had randomized the patients one in one to receive either tertiprestin plus albumin or placebo plus albumin, and then they kept on doubling the dose if there was no response. And you can see here in the patients who have responded, the serum creatinine is nicely coming down as compared to patients who did not respond when the serum creatinine is going up. And you can see that the HRS reversal, though there is no difference at six months, but there's some response here in, in the first two weeks. It means the patients who respond will respond quite early in the treatment. And the best predictor was a low base then serum creatinine. No patient who had got a serum creatinine more than 5.6 milligram per deciliter responded to treatment with tertiprestin. The message is start treatment early and don't for serum creatinine to go beyond fives and sixes. And this is the same group which published this data in 2016. And they said that we don't want a complete HRS reversal. Even if it's a change from baseline in serum creatinine, that will convert it into survival as long as there is a more than 50% decrease in serum creatinine from the baseline. And if you look at this data, 60% of patients who had a significant decrease in baseline had actually not achieved the complete HRS reversal, which the previous study had. So so aim for a decrease in serum creatinine rather than complete HRS reverse. And you will, uh, we saw here that the 90-day overall survival was more than 50%. You can see here it's more than 50%. And approximately 30% of patients received transplantation and the transplantation free survival with responders and non-responders was 30% in both treatment arms. So this gave us a message that you need to start treatment early and not aim for treatment, a complete HRS reversal. You just aim for a decrease in serum creatinine, which is more than 50% of the baseline. The question is, Will all patients with HRS respond to tertiprestin and albumin? And a meta-analysis showed only 50% respond. And this is important because tertiprestin has got the side effects of a V1 vasoconstrictor and has got severe side effects. So we want to restrict it to that group which we think will respond. The question is, can we predict which group is going to respond to tertiprestin and albumin and which group is not? Because very important to know when to stop as important it is to know when to start. So we say serum creatinine, either less than three milligram per, per deciliter between three and five, very poor response if it goes beyond that. If there is no response by day four, we say probably there is not gonna be response any further. You start the treatment early and stop it if there is no response by day four, and you need to aim for a sustained increase in the mean arterial pressure rather than only the initial rise. And this is a very elegant piece of work by Salvatore and group where they actually looked at ACLF grade one, grade two, grade three, and you can see in each of these, if you have a low baseline serum creatinine, your response is much better. So lower the serum creatinine despite the, the grade of ACLF, your response is going to be better at low baseline serum creatinine. However, you also see that if the grade of ACLF is higher with more multi-system organ failure, you will get a lesser response. And that is predicted here. You can see here that these are the responders, these are the non-responders. The responders survive much better, uh, 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 the mortality is much better in the responders as compared to the non-responders. And this, the mortality keeps on going up as the grade of ACLF goes up. So more the multi-system organ failure, higher is the mortality. So is it that the response is not taking place because the patient is too sick? Or is it that the extra hepatic organ failures are actually are actually acting as a perpetrators as a vicious cycle of cytokine storm, more inflammation, more system organ failure, and that is leading to non-response of these patients. And this, if you look at this, the same study, you can see that between ACLF 1 and 2, these are the responders, the mortality, this is the ACLF uh, 1 and 2, these are the non-responders. There is a difference, but when you look at ACLF 3, responders and non-responders is hardly any difference. And the mortality in ACLF3 is very high. So this asks, leads to a question, should we even contemplate using terlipressin in patients with ACLF3? But if you look at their mortality, which is 28 days here, they, they, these are the responders, 
It's about 40%. But if you look at the mortality here, which is a non-responder, it's about 80%. So there is a difference in mortality, though not at 90 days, but at 28 days in ACLF3. So what we say is if you have got good prognostic factors, the bilirubin is not high, the systemic inflammation is not there, you can start terlipressin and you can stop if you feel there is no response, there's no mean arterial pressure going up or the serum creatinine is not coming down. So I often get asked this question, should you give a bolus? Should you give a, a as an infusion? This was a study published in 2016 where there were about 50 patients. You can see this is the infusion group. This is the bolus group. And, and they started with two milligram per day as an infusion versus 0.5 milligrams every four hours as boluses to begin with, and they kept on increasing till they reached 12, 12 milligrams. And you can see that the maximum daily dose of terlipressin as well as the mean daily dose of terlipressin is much lower in the infusion group as compared to the bolus group. And the very important thing is the number of side effects. 20% developed side effects in the infusion group, whereas 43% developed in the bolus groups. So therefore, the conclusion was that the terlipressin when it's given by infusion is better tolerated than intravenous, and it seems to be more effective as well because the, the survival, transplant free survival at 90 days was better with the infusion group. This is our paper, which literally got published about a month back. This is the first paper looking at terlipressin using critically ill children with liver disease. And we have shown, you can see here, this is the HRS AKI where the creatinine is nicely coming down. With a non-HRS AKI, the creatinine is not coming down or going up. And you can see that the lack Tate is not making a difference here, which means that we are not causing microvascular ischemia, which is leading to high lactate, and therefore the side effects are lesser. So comparison with noradrenaline, because that's the most commonly used vasopressor, Previously, people have compared terlipressin boluses with noradrenaline infusion and have found equal efficacy, whereas this study is the first study which has compared noradrenaline infusion with terlipressin infusion. And you can see whether it's day four or day seven, the response is much better of HRS response with or on day four and day seven by using terlipressin 26.7% versus 11% and 41% versus 20% at day seven. And if you look at the univariate and multivariate analysis, whether it is to do with survival or it is to do with HRS response, the use of terlipressin favors both HRS reversal as well as survival. Uh, but the, everything comes with a cost. If you look at the cost of terlipressin and vasopressin as compared to noradrenaline, it's much costlier uh, than, than a while of noradrenaline. And therefore, I think a lot of people would prefer using noradrenaline as we guys do. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the protocol is. So this is how we rationalize it. You've got hepatorenal syndrome. If there's ACLF, you start with terlipressin. If terlipressin is not available as in a lot of centers, you admit the patient to ICU and start noradrenaline. So in United States, for example, terlipressin is not available, so they sometimes use vasopressin as an infusion as a, in place of terlipressin. If these things don't work, what are the other treatments? You could do a transjugular intrahepatic potosystemic shunt because that will increase the effective renal blood flow. You can start renal replacement therapy, but that's a very controversial topic. I'm going to speak on this topic in the World Congress in, in, uh, in December, where we're going to talk about should we consider renal replacement therapy because it's a commitment? What are the endpoints? Are you aiming for transplantation? Are you aiming for free, uh, transplant free survival? So again, very controversial when to start and when to end. And if you are planning a transplant and the patient has required renal replacement therapy for more than six weeks, it is said that the patient will end up getting a liver kidney transplantation rather than only a liver transplantation. This is what we do at King's. We start off with noradrenaline because that's our staff is much more used to it and we use it very often in other patients as well. When we reach one, we add a terlipressin infusion, closely monitor the ischemic side effects. We double the terlipressin if there's no response in 48 hours and stop terlipressin if there's no response completely by day four and we consider alternative treatments. Liver transplantation, of course, remains a def, a, the best and the most definitive treatment. The one and five year survival rates are not that bad, 77% and 69%. But if you have a 
pre-transplant renal dysfunction that will determine post-transplant renal dysfunction as well. And patients might get chronic kidney disease and be dependent on chronic dialysis. And as I said, if you give renal replacement therapy for more than six weeks, this patient will probably become a candidate for liver kidney transplantation. This is just to summarize everything I've said, how you diagnose acute kidney injury in a patient with liver disease and how you manage it by removing the precipitants first and then thinking about the medical therapy in the form of vasoconstrictors and albumin and if things don't work and patients getting fluid overloaded, acidotic and hyperkalemic starting renal replacement therapy. So the question is, what is there for us in the future? Are there new therapies and what can be done to improve the prognosis of these sick children before these therapies become available. Right? The crux is differentiate hepatorenal syndrome from acute tubular necrosis. Because if you wrongly give terlipressin to a patient with acute tubular necrosis who is actually who is not hepatorenal syndrome, you will end up causing more harm. So you we need to have biomarkers, whether it's in the form of uh, interleukin-6, whether it's the form of NGAL, which can differentiate hepatorenal syndrome from acute tubular necrosis. We've got for example, serolexin recombinant form of human, human peptide, which will cause selective vasodilatation in the renal vasculature, increasing blood flow, but not causing hypertension. And if this drug is, is shown to work in human beings, that will be a great achievement in patients with hepatorenal syndrome. And very, very importantly is reduce your inflammation and organ failure because AKI or HRS AKI or ATN, they take place as a part of the multi-system organ failure. So plasmapheresis can remove your inflammatory and vasoactive mediators and decrease the surge response and mortality, mesenchymal, stem cells, uh, mesenchymal stem cell transplantation and granulocyte colony stimulating factors will also help, but they are all experimental and yet not tried in humans. So in conclusion, we need to know what is acute decompensation, what is ACLF, because they're two distinct entities and the acute kidney injuries behave very differently in them. ACLF associated with multi-system organ failure, the criteria to diagnose AKI in a liver versus a non-liver failure patients is different. Every AKI in cirrhosis is not hepatorenal. There's a role of biomarkers to differentiate. And hopefully we will study, uh, we will start a study in the European group looking to how to differentiate between different kinds of AKI in chronic kidney disease. We need to prevent precipitating factors and vasoconstrictors seem to have a role. But we have a couple of unanswered questions. Is at what point can we deny a patient a liver transplantation in this group? Or can we use vasoconstrictors like terlipressin as a prolonged therapy to work as a bridge for transplantation? These are the unanswered questions. Very quickly, as I said, I'm the chair for the critical care nephrology of ESPNIC. If any of you want to get involved in the activities of critical care nephrology group of ESPNIC, please do drop us a line and we will get you associated. We have a very active member group and we will get you uh, associated with that. And this is a huge resource which uh, Stuart Goldstein and myself had put together in a book called the Critical care nephrology and renal replacement therapy in children. So all about AKI, all about CRRT and CRRT in different diseases is discussed in this book. I once again, thank you all for inviting me and asking me to talk on a, on a topic which is very close to my heart. Thank you. Thanks a lot to dear Professor Akash Deep for a nice presentation. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have Professor Deep uh, with us together online. Uh, Professor Deep, uh, did you have my voice? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hi. Uh, good early morning to you. <laughs> <laughs> it is a uh, reverse. I'm on night shift, so I'm on call. I'm just taking the handover. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks uh, for your nice presentation, and thanks for joining us online, even with your uh, difficult situation and uh, hard working condition. Uh, I hope you are doing well and Thank can you. rest a bit. I just want to say something special. Uh, I hope uh, it to be true. Panemi apka suagat he or or hemari ni mantran ku suvikar karni kili dan hi vat. Oh my God! You're taking me <laughs> back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks to you for accepting the invitation again. Thank you very much. You're so welcome.
will the questions be at the end or uh, i uh um, I mean, I, I plan to ask you the questions because we have, uh, we have a question. If you let me and if you agree with me, I'm yeah, gonna. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, is there any role for Engel or Cystein C for AKI diagnosis in your experience? So at the moment, what we are Sorry, using Sorry, just is... at the second part. Do you check these biomarkers to identify AKI before creatinine increase? So as I said, at the moment, we are wholly and solely dependent on creatinine. We don't use it currently, but there is a grant application gone to the European Society where, we'll be, where we will start using uh, these biomarkers, especially NGAL. So we are in touch with Bioporto and, and, and the plan is to use Bioporto alongside creatinine first to make sure that we are able to pick up things before creatinine rise and institute the medical therapy because at the moment we are, as I said, dependent on two criteria which we feel are not very efficient for kidney disease. So, and, but to answer your question, we are not here yet, but we will start using it soon in the future. Thanks a lot for your uh, nice and complete definition. And also again for a wonderful uh, lecture, I have the chance of uh, enjoying your presentation for multiple times. Uh, and it is so nice to have you and uh, see you even online, but face to face. I wish and hope to have you beside us in person uh, and have the chance of hosting you in Iran one day. Oh, wow. That's, that's a pleasure. That's, that's an honor. Thank you. Uh, and my dear professor, uh, Dr. Uh, Arai wants to share some greetings with you. Yeah, sure. Because he's so uh, excited uh, with your lecture, with you and everything related to you. I, I'm uh, passing to Dr. Arai. Uh, dear uh, Dr. Akash, uh, it is uh, so nice of you to accompany us uh, during this Congress. Uh, we are so fascinated by your uh, special personality, uh, your knowledge, and all of them together. Uh, we can learn from you and all the colleagues, of course, uh, uh, which are helping us uh, in this Congress. So uh, thanks again from me and also from the other, uh, other um, colleagues that are involved with the executive committee uh, of the 32nd Congress on Pediatrics in Tehran. Thanks again. Thank you so much. And as I, always, as I said, when we were recording this talk as well, Iran has a special place in my heart. And so thank you very much for, for, for inviting me and thank you for making me a part of this and, Congress. Uh, you. And you also uh, have a, an a, spe a special part in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So can I just ask, am I, uh, will there be more questions towards the end of the session or am I allowed to nip off? I uh, I think uh, yes we want taking much of your time just uh, thanks uh, many many thanks are coming up in the chat section as you can see uh, we enjoy a lot and uh, the biggest gain oh uh, and another question is upcoming may you see in chat section yeah. if you let me I ask yeah sure what what do you discontinue diuretic for diagnosis HRS in seretic patient. It is very difficult. So you're talking of a of a cirrhotic patient here who is developing AKI. So he's got cirrhosis, he's got ascites, and he's now the serum creatinine has gone up. So in this patient, we give a trial of forty eight hours of diuretics and give albumin. And despite that, if the creatinine is not being able to calm down, that's when we say that you are actually have satisfy the definition of HRS. It's a trial of 48 hours. We don't discontinue it completely. We give a trial. If the if after discontinuing diuretics, your creatinine is coming down, so probably it's not HRS. If it is, it is holding on the same state, it is probably HRS. So it's a trial of 48 hours of diuretics. Oh, thanks a lot for your complete answer. Uh, I don't see any question uh, and we won't take your time anymore. Uh, I Thank wish you, you uh, have a very, very nice days in front. We Thank you very and much. Is, uh, with this COVID pandemic. Thank you so very much. And as I Again, said, I, appre thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate your hospitality. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Okay, thanks a lot, uh, dear participants and dear audiences. Uh, we had a very nice lecture about uh, AKI in uh, chronic liver disease, and we are going to be with uh, Professor Kazem Rahimi uh, from University of Oxford, London, UK, with hypertension burden in children. Uh, we are going to have the video lecture. Uh, then uh, with the question part, we are going to be with you. Please ask your questions in chat section. Hello, my name is Kazem Rahimi, and it's a great pleasure to have been invited to this session to present the findings of um, two of our relatively recent studies, one looking at the burden of hypertension in children, and the other one is looking at the effect of um, blood pressure lowering treatment um, in adults. To start with the first study, as I'm sure you're all aware, childhood hypertension is known to be associated with hypertension in adulthood, and that subsequently with adverse cardiovascular events. Measurement of childhood hypertension has been more complicated than those in, in adults, in part because of the um, unstable readings that one obtains. Typically, use of percentiles based on age, sex, and height have been recommended to define the normal distribution of blood pressure and that of hypertension. How elevated blood pressure is defined as 90th to 95th percentile and hypertension, anything above 95th percentile um, on at least three separate occasions um, of reading. In the first study, we went to interested to look at the worldwide prevalence of childhood of, um, hypertension. Um, and that was a systematic review um, that um, identified 47 studies um, and this plot summarizes the main findings. On the x-axis is the age of the children um, from um, six years to 19 years. And on the y-axis, the, the prevalence of disease. And that is stratified by the three different years of 2000, 2010, and 2015. Overall, the prevalence of hypertension was 4% um, across all years. If one looks at the age distribution, there was a peak at the puberty at around age 15 with a decline afterwards. And if one compares the different years, there was roughly a 75% increase in prevalence of hypertension from year 2000 to year 2015. Stratifying some of the analysis um, as summarized in, in this figure, um, some of the you know, key highlights were the heterogeneity of prevalence by uh, weight of the individuals um, or by the body mass index. Um, as you can see here in the top selection, um, for instance, the prevalence of hypertension in people who had a normal weight was 1.9. In overweight, it was almost 5%. And in obese, it was in the order of 15%, and as you would expect it to be higher. There were also some regional differences in prevalence of um, um, hypertension to just flag in the Eastern Mediterranean region, and the prevalence was a bit higher than in some of the other regions, um, with uh, average prevalence reported um, at, in the range of 5.2%. Of course, in children, there is very, very little evidence about um, how to manage elevated blood pressure and hypertension. In particular, pharmacological interventions um, are not uh, well founded, and most of the intervention um, centers around lifestyle management and monitoring um, of the blood pressure um, over um, years. On the other hand, in adults, um, of course, we have had set up, uh, several major clinical trials so far. And in a few years ago, we looked at the amount of evidence available. Um, and if one looks at just at the major randomized clinical trials, so far, there have been over half a million individuals who have participated in those trials um, of uh, blood pressure lowering treatment. So in, uh, in a recent study that was uh, presented at the European Society of um, Cardiology as uh, one of the late breakers, we were interested to look at the effect of blood pressure lowering treatment on cardiovascular outcomes, but stratified by presence or absence of cardiovascular disease and also stratified and by the level of blood pressure that individuals had. 
a baseline that is at the time um, of um, going into the clinical trials. So the background to this is, um, which some of you may be aware of, is we know, of course, a lot about the effect of uh, pharmacological blood pressure lowering uh, on average, which has shown to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease um, substantially. But this is in particular for people who have got a high or very high blood pressure. There has been more uncertainty around the effect of blood pressure lowering when blood pressure is below the typical threshold of hypertension diagnosis, which is um, usually in adults in the order of 140 millimeter, millimeter mercury, and also whether the effects differ between those who have had a previous cardiovascular disease and those um, who uh, have not. Um, and the distinction here is we call them typically primary versus um, secondary prevention settings. So these uncertainties collectively have led to um, quite different guideline recommendations and of course variability in care across the world. For this um, study, uh, we use the resource provided by the Blood Pressure Lowering Treatment Cyrus Collaboration, which is a collaboration um, that um, I have been leading since um, 2014. Um, it is a collaboration of um, some of the largest randomized clinical trials of blood pressure lowering that have ever been conducted. And for trials to be um, eligible for inclusion into the collaboration, they must have at least 1,000 person years of follow in each randomly allocated arm. And they could compare one drug class versus a placebo, different drug classes against each other, or they could compare a more versus less intensive blood pressure lowering regimen. And for this particular analysis that I'm going to present the findings for, and 48 randomized clinical trials contributed data comprising about 350,000 randomized participants. This makes it the largest type of analysis ever conducted um, before at the level of um, individual patient. For this analysis, we were, as I said, we were interested in major cardiovascular events as the outcome, and that is defined as fatal or non-fatal stroke, fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease, or heart failure leading to death or hospitalization. I won't go too much into the details of the methods, but in a sense, this was a pooled analysis where all the data were uh, harmonized into a single data set, and, and then we applied a con conventional hazards model um, to look at the treatment effects. And because, as you can imagine, different trials have different intensities of blood pressure lowering, the trials were harmonized for a five millimeter mercury um, systolic blood pressure reduction. To just show some of the characteristics of the individuals included in those studies, um, stratified oh, in the people who have no prior cardiovascular disease, that is a primary prevention setting, and in the second column, people who had a prior cardiovascular disease. Um, Follow-up duration was on average about four years, uh, and there were more women um, in the primary prevention setting and then in the secondary prevention setting. But what is important here is by having such a large data set, we could stratify the patient population um, into different categories based on the blood pressure baseline um, from a uh, systolic blood pressure of less than 120 millimeter mercury all the way up to equal or greater than 170 millimeter mercury. And as the highlight in this um, table shows, uh, we had still several thousands of individuals falling into the categories where blood pressure is uh, conventionally considered to be normal or only mildly elevated. And these are obviously adult trials as one, as one would expect. A substantial number of them would have had previous um, cardiovascular events or uh, diseases that would render them to be at high risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and as the lower section of this table shows, many of them were also receiving treatment for uh, prevention of um, cardiovascular disease. So this is the first um, uh, figure from the analysis. So one of the key questions um, that uh, we were asking ourselves is, to what extent is the intensity of blood pressure uh, itself um, a modifying factor for the relative treatment effects. And this is a meta regression plot um, on the x-axis. You can see the intensity of systolic blood pressure level 
um, for each of the clinical trials, with each of the clinical trials being represented um, with a circle on this plot. And then the y-axis is the hazard ratio for major cardiovascular events, or if you like, the relative risk reduction observed. And as the figure shows is we just see a um, graded association between intensity of blood pressure reduction and the relative treatment effects, confirming that the more intensively the blood pressure is reduced, at least at the trial level, and the more intensive and the, 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 the stronger the treatment effects. Now going to the major outcomes, and these analyses are stratified and for a five millimeter mercury systolic blood pressure reduction to enable a better comparison of the trials with each other. So this um, plot shows the effect in people who had uh, cardiovascular disease at baseline, that is the secondary prevention setting, um, and it shows that for each five millimeter mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure, the hazard ratio was 0.89. And if one looks at um, people who had no cardiovascular disease at baseline, the hazard ratio was very similar, 0.91, suggesting that presence or absence of cardiovascular disease does not seem to affect um, the relative risk reductions observed across those trials. The findings were relatively similar when one looked at the different components of major cardiovascular disease, and that is stroke, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, or cardiovascular disease. Again, there was no evidence of um, a treatment modification in people who had a previous cardiovascular disease um, or people who did it. And this is perhaps uh, one of the most striking findings um, from this study in this summarized in this slide, where on the top panel, we looked at people who had a known previous cardiovascular disease. Um, that is um, the secondary prevention. And in the lower section of the figure, we looked at people who had no prior cardiovascular disease. And in each of those uh, subgroups, uh, the trial population was further stratified into those categories of baseline blood pressure that I described earlier. And what this figure shows is um, there was no evidence that the baseline blood pressure itself um, had any modifying effect on the relative risk reductions observed across the trials. In other words, it didn't matter whether someone had a relatively normal blood pressure or a very high blood pressure. And the same amount of blood pressure reduction in this case, five millimeter mercury, led to a relatively similar uh, proportion of risk reductions um, uh, in the populations investigated. So the summary of um, this study is that the relative effect of blood pressure lowering is proportional to the intensity of um, systolic blood pressure reduction. That means the more intensive, um, the greater the relative risk reduction observed. If one just standardized the, the, the studies by a five millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure, we observed that the risk of major cardiovascular events was reduced um, by about 10%. There was no evidence that those proportional risk reductions vary by baseline blood pressure values and down to the lowest blood pressure category of 120 millimeter mercury in both primary and secondary prevention settings. Now to conclude, um, atherosclerosis, as I'm sure you're all aware, is a lifelong process, often starting in childhood. Um, and um, hypertension, as um, the systematic review that I presented earlier, is relatively common in children and adolescents. Um, and it tends to be worse in uh, obese um, and um, overweight children. But when one looks at the age stratification, there seems to be a peak um, during puberty, um, but the effects are not sustained um, after puberty, where there is a decline in the prevalence of um, hypertension. And if one looks at the adult studies, we see that there is no threshold below which pharmacological blood pressure lowering has a different effect on prevention of cardiovascular outcomes. I hope um, these findings collectively um, provide a sense that and the evidence so far, as far as we are concerned, suggests um, that whether this is a lifestyle intervention or pharmacological intervention, um, it seems that at least for prevention of cardiovascular disease, um, the lower seems to be better. So I'd like to stop there and um, just to thank the BPLTTC collaboration and the steering committee, the core analytic group, and the funders
including many of the trials that uh, trialists that have supported the um, activities over the past few years. Um, and I would like to thank you um, for your attention. <laughs> Dear Professor Rahimi, thanks for your nice presentation and informative slides. Uh, if you are with us still and you have my voice, uh, yeah, regards, I can hear you. I can hear you. regards, dear Professor, again, welcome to the panel and thanks for accepting our invitation and thanks, thanks for a wonderful lecture. Thanks for, for having me. It's our biggest honor, of course. Uh, if you let me first, uh, there is a question. Uh, if you let me, uh, I go and ask it to you. Yeah, of course, go ahead. Thanks a lot. How can we detect end organ damage in children with chronic hypertension? Um, I, I should have uh, put a disclaimer. I'm, I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm an adult cardiologist, so I'm not uh, too familiar with it, but I suspect that is not uh, too different from what we know in adults. Um, I suspect, I mean, if you define end organ damage as left ventricular hypertrophy, well, if you define it as uh, renal dysfunction um, and any other measures, I mean, those, you know, you would have the same tools for detecting those organ damage. But the point that, that we made in the, in the second study, that in a sense that the, the management of the blood pressure does not matter or should not matter whether people have gotten end organ damage or not. Of course, they've got, they, would be they would be having a higher risk um, of adverse outcomes. Um, but when it comes to prevention, um, there is, it, 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 the distinction is not binary. Thanks a lot. So uh, nice definition. Uh, if you have uh, your, yourself, if you have any comments, any point that you want to share with us, we would be so happy. Um, I mean, I, I said, I mean, it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to have been invited to this um, uh, conference and uh, sad to not be there in person. But given the circumstances, I, I guess with the Zoom call, it, uh, it tends to work and uh, I, I tuned in a bit earlier and listened to the previous talk. It seems like a great session. Yes, Congratulations to you guys for organizing it. Of course, thanks a lot to you for joining. And of course, with uh, such a distinguished uh, lectures like you, um, it, would be, uh, it should be a wonderful panel. Uh, again, thanks a lot for joining. You uh, are uh, the big honor of the panel and our biggest uh, proud uh, as an Iranian people. Uh, hope and wish to see you one day uh, face to face, not just online. Uh, my dear professor, Dr. Aghai wants to share some greetings with you. I'm passing the uh, voice to the Dr. Aghai uh, now. Thank Dr. Aghai. Um, uh, dear Dr. Rahimi, uh, dear professor, uh, it is a great honor of all of us to have you with us. And thanks, uh, I know you are a very busy man and uh, I can understand that you have, uh, you have uh, did a great job to accept this um, uh, invitation and uh, support our Congress. Uh, I wish you uh, a very good day and thanks again on behalf of all our scientific and executive committee here in Tehran. Thank you very much. I, I hope that it was of some use to you and to your audience and uh, it was always great. a great pleasure. It was great. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Bye bye. Again, take Hello. care, pleasure. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Hello. Bye. Office. Thanks a lot to all dear participants and audiences. Uh, I am sure you're enjoy enjoying the uh, panel and enjoying the informative lectures. Uh, on the uh, Next part, we are uh, we would have uh, Professor uh, Andrea Sekei from uh, Semmelweis University, Budapest, Hungary. Uh, dear Professor Sekei, if you are with us, if you're online uh, and uh, have my voice, uh, shall we have you now online? Dear Professor Andrea Sekei, uh, if you have my voice, uh, I would be so happy if you respond. <laughs> 
I think, unfortunately, we don't have the chance of having Professor, Professor Seke online with us. Uh, fortunately, and uh, we have the uh, video lecture of Professor Andrea Seke uh, that is uh, awesome and uh, very informative and very useful. Uh, as unfortunately, we uh, don't have a professor with us, we are going to uh, upload the complete video lecture on the website, uh, on the Congress website, and also the application. Uh, you would uh, find out from the application and you can download it and enjoy it. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that you enjoyed the whole panel together. Uh, I am Dr. Ailara Hangari. I was with you in the nephrology panel. Uh, as you know, uh, tomorrow uh, we are going to be with you with new panels. Uh, you can find the, the, the complete program with the Zoom links and uh, also the password in the website and application. Uh, we would be very happy to see you uh, in panels. We are going to have very, very good lectures and very, very good topics to discuss. I uh, hope you have a good time uh, and take care. Uh, good day, good night, good morning, anytime, uh, in any place you are. Enjoy the science.